Good evening, everyone. Thought we'll share the video this time so you know it's not some uh, AI bot giving the webinar today. Uh, this is one of our uh, popular webinar series uh, where we just talk about vibrometry in general and uh, with some application examples. Uh, so let's get to it. Uh, brief outline of what we're going to talk about just introduction in case you're not familiar with polytech couple of slides on polytech and then motivation behind vibration testing why would one get into it what do they measure um and in the past i used to do the application examples last but this time kind of bumped it up some let's look at what the data looks like first and then get into uh, vibrometry and uh, you know different types of vibrometers. So with that uh, brief outline, um, yeah, just a couple of slides on Polytech. I've uh, been around since 1967. Optical measurement systems, optical metrology is all we do. So uh, you better be decent at it by now. Uh, we try to focus uh, more on what you're after and not necessarily products. And that's why you saw a couple of intro slides that talked about a bunch of options. Um, try to put material out there, not only about vibrometry, but um, uh, vibrations, acoustics in general. So try to be a facilitator, um, educator. Uh, hopefully we come off that way as well. Um, <clears throat> as far as where we are located, uh, the, the world headquarters is based in uh, Germany. So everything is made in Germany. And uh, once it arrives in US, uh, you know, it's uh, completely supported by three main offices in uh, Massachusetts, Michigan, and uh, the North American headquarters in Orange County, California. And then we have a few satellite offices as well. So this kind of gives you a, a um, yeah, I guess a geography 101 on Polytech um, and uh, our offices. With that little intro, let's get uh, to it. Um, what we're gonna talk about is about vibrations uh, without contact, so non-contact vibrations, and then uh, specifically with regards to vibrometers. But when it comes to vibrations, uh, first of all, it's everywhere. It's, there are some vibrations that are good, some that are not good, but one of the first steps that comes into picture is measuring those vibrations. So whether it's the um, a cabin of a car or a plane or uh, vibrations on the propellers of a drone or ultrasonic welding applications, appliances, uh, consumer electronics, you know, musical instruments, uh, seismic data, bridge test, all these, you know, one commonality, even though these is a very broad spectrum of applications, one common commonality is vibrations. So uh, one of the first steps is characterizing this vibration. And there are several techniques to measure vibrations, of course, but uh, this kind of gives you an idea of where all, I mean, and this is just a very small subset, you know, of, of things that vibrate. Uh, and uh, um, I mean, even acoustics, it's just vibrations in air in, in some ways. So there's, there's vibrations everywhere. Now, uh what 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 do we measure what kind of analysis are we doing uh, by measuring vibrations regardless of what technique so it could be modal analysis that is just fundamental understanding of a structure with natural frequencies mode shapes damping stress strain analysis so if you want to kind of identify fatigue areas for example troubleshooting it's just pretty really something's wrong with this and i need to just measure it to see what's going on a structural health monitoring, this gets us into wave propagation studies, this gets us into defect detection. FE2 experimental correlation is also big. You know, you cannot design or try thousand different permutations and combinations in experimental work. However, you can do it in simulation. So testing a couple of um, examples and then kind of extrapolating the results into more and more cases using uh, a better model. Inline quality control, Transducer development, this of course is a very broad field because it could mean in terms of um, 
medical devices. It could mean in terms of haptics, you know, metamaterials, all kinds of different applications can fall under uh, these defect detection. And then noise source identification. At the end of the day, vibrations, at least some of those uh, are related and can be related to sound pressure levels. So uh, we also have customers using vibration data for noise source identification. So this kind of gives you you know, a little bit of like, okay, what did what do we do with these vibrations? Of course, measuring vibrations is just means to an end. Ultimately, you are trying to make something faster, better, more cost effective, efficient, safe. You know, these are the so, sort of overarching uh, goals of any vibration measurement. So <clears throat> what are the fundamental components of a vibration test, right? So of course, the device under test, whatever you are testing that's moving, uh, that's number one. Then you have some excitation. So either it's self-excited, like um, let's say a wind turbine blade or an engine, uh, or it could be something you excite externally. So there we could be using piezos or uh, laser or hammer, something like that. So you are, the, the device under test is being excited somehow. Then you need something to measure it, the sensor, the detection side of things. And then finally, you need um, a data acquisition system. You, you've got this measurement. How do you acquire the data? What do, what do you use for signal processing parameters, your frequency of interest, your sampling frequency, resolution, number of averages, all that. All that's controlled through the data acquisition system. Today, of course, our attention is going to be on the detection side of things. So we're going to talk about sensors. Specifically, we're going to talk about laser Doppler vibrometers. So with that uh, background, before we go into what is a laser Doppler vibrometer and how it works, uh, let's just uh, have a quick look at a few examples, just so you get a better feel for what kind of data are we talking about here. So uh, first, a couple of slides are about uh, this, what we call scanning vibrometer or full field measurements. So this means that we have measured a bunch of data points on a structure uh, being a cover of a hard disk drive or a piezo actuator, a brake rotor plus caliper assembly, just a plate, uh, turbine blade, bliss components. So these are a bunch of different points put together and you can also see that we can animate these things as well, basically what we call operation deflection shapes. So this is like gives you a broad overview, you know, that uh, what, what the data could look like coming out of a vibrometer. And we'll uh, discuss in the next few slides where vibrometers are preferred. Now, those were more macro structures or mesoscale and not micro. So now this slide gives you examples of microstructures being measured using uh, the same technology but by having the vibrometer go through a microscope, looking at tiny MEM structures, whether it's uh, inertial sensors, pressure sensors, you know, micro cantilevers, flow sensors, PMUT, CMUTs, and um, MEMS microphones, you know, all these um, tiny little things where, I mean, the, 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 it's a rarefied field. I mean, the choices of sensors that are out there just becomes more and more limited, the smaller you go in size. But again, we are still measuring these, what we call sequential scans of multiple points, one at a time and recreating an image. Let's look at something in mesoscale in a little more detail. For example, this is a hard drive slider. So that's basically just this, this, this front portion of the suspension arm that you see here. And this is a data collected in three dimensions because there is definitely uh, some cross correlation between in plane and out of plane modes, but you can see the modal density is very high and uh, we can resolve these in 3D structures. Um, another example would be, you know, as I mentioned in one of the slides, this FE or finite element to experimental correlation, EMA stands for experimental modal analysis. In this case, we are using a 3D scanning vibrometer system. And you can see we are using a, a shaker to excite, so this will be the excitation. This is our device under test, our sensor, and the data acquisition is part of it. On the right side, you are seeing an FE model and then the actual experimental data. So 
one would take this stuff, this kind of data, and then try to calibrate the FE model to better match the experimental data. Um, the tweaks they may make are changes in the boundary condition, stiffness, you know, uh, damping, you know, material properties, that, that kind of thing to to change or kind of make, make the, the simulation meet or match the um, experimental data. Uh, and it's not all about scanning vibrometers. Uh, you know, you, there are applications in just a very simple single point and shoot type measurements as well. This is a particularly interesting example because here we are talking not just uh, natural frequencies, but this is like high velocity, high impact shock testing type application. On the top, you see here where it's just a, a projectile hitting a surface and you see the response. And if we zoom in uh, on a very small, this is like half a millisecond area here, you can see this sudden spike, which is that first impact. And the, 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 the interest here was to identify what that impact velocity is. On the bottom here, you see the um, a pyroshock type event, which is like an exponential, but I mean um, different velocities depending on the on the charge. On the left side, you see two different single point vibrometers being tested. Uh, one of our high speed vibrometers from the past generation, and then the latest sort of dropout free Q tech uh, technology being tested as well. So, wanted to show you uh, one of these in the wild, meaning you know how is it actually you know what could be a setup like, what could the setup be looking like um, in in reality. Um, so yeah, hopefully this gives you an idea about single point measurements. Um, traditionally, measurements on skin are extremely challenging uh, for an optical technique. Um, but in this particular case, the goal was to kind of just understand the wave propagation uh, as a response to, let's say, some kind of haptic feedback. Uh, that uh, and haptic feedback is this this new modality that I think everybody has sort of experience with a little buzz from your watch or your phone uh, giving you some kind of alert. So there's vibration-based um, sort of communication uh, modality. Uh, in this case, the goal was to kind of understand the wave propagation in the skin. And um, these are traditionally challenging measurements, but uh, with the latest technology, it's, uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not challenging anymore, I guess. Sticking with uh, skin, uh, let's look at one more example. Um, and um, yeah, this is uh, work with uh, some researchers at UC Santa Barbara. And again, um, trying to understand the wave propagation and uh, skin measurements and how these frequencies or what frequencies, what kind of inherent filters are being set up because of the characteristics of skin or muscle or tissue to um, dampen out certain frequencies. So this was a scanning vibrometer measurement. And um, um, this again shows how um, these measurements work. Uh, these are very non-traditional applications in the past. You're used to seeing cars and planes and trains and bridges. So wanted to kind of mix it up with some new um, uh, uh, different type of applications. So. That kind of gives you a little bit of an idea. One of the emerging uh, areas of research is uh, haptics and uh, mid-air haptics uh, as well. Mid-air haptics is, um, uh, is, is, is basically a way to create a virtual shape or a virtual feeling of you touching something without actually anything being there. And this is done by um, synchronizing a bunch of transducers to create this this feeling of touch. Uh, so on the left side, what you're seeing is an, uh, an array of transducers uh, being excited and being tested to see what the um, vibration mapping looks like. And this is at 40 kilohertz. This particular field on the right, what you are seeing is basically sound field characterization using a vibrometer. So where you would uh, basically shoot the vibrometer at something that is stationary with the source uh, going uh, orthogonal, and then any change in the refractive index will show up as change in uh, velocity. And this field is called vibrorefractometry or refractovibrometry. I've <laughs> seen it both ways. So here you see how the, the sound field looks like. And so this is not 
uh, a typical measurement, not easy, but definitely used by uh, folks in the haptics industry or even the, the, the sensors, the ultrasound, uh, ultrasonic sensors. So let's say for a, a parking sensor, things like that, um, use a vibrometer to characterize it. On the same uh, subject, here's a nice work by um, folks at uh, University of Texas, Austin. Um, they do it at uh, a micro scale as well and in meso scale. So in this case, uh, again, uh, the setup is for sound field characterization. In this case, there's an ultrasound transducer here with the Polytech vibrometer looking down at a stationary surface. In this case, it's a, it's a wafer. And then uh, repeating the experiment uh, the way it was defined before. And uh, yeah, special thanks to our uh, friends at uh, UT Austin, Professor Neil Hall's group. And here, uh, two very nice measurements. One on the left is for uh, the sound field characterization. And on the right is uh, just characterization of the, the, the PMARS, the, the, the little transducers. How do they, what's the phase relationship between uh, adjacent, uh, is there any crosstalk? And you can see the size, the total size and also the size of each element here. So here the goal would be to understand the, um, if there is any crosstalk, what's the phase relationship between these components. So yeah, those two are more related to kind of sound field characterization. Now this is also very new. So we'll kind of stay on the MEMS side for a little while longer. And one of the challenges traditionally has been when it comes to MEMS sensors, when they are finally packaged, they are encapsulated. There's a silicon, it's a cap. It's these are, these are called capped MEMS devices. So if you open up the device, then yes, you can measure, but then you are, you know, affecting the dynamics of the structure in some way, you know, whether it's uh, the, the Q factor or, you know, just the boundary conditions. So this was a challenging application. And so we came up with uh, a system that can measure through silicon caps. So that's what we call our MSA IRIS. And we have a special webinar dedicated to all these MEMS applications. So I won't go into too much detail, but this is uh, also a problem that has been solved now. And when you look at the data, so for example, this is data on a MEMS accelerometer at 355 kilohertz. And uh, when you look at the data, it doesn't look any different, uh, you know, using the, the, the IR camera. And it basically, when you start making measurements, it looks like any other measurement. In this case, I want to point your attention to a couple of things. <clears throat> Number one, all these little dots are basically measurement locations. So you have the control to dictate basically what kind of spatial resolution do you want? Um, do you want um, 10 points in your area or, uh, you know, or 200,000 points, you can determine what kind of spatial resolution you need to um, resolve a certain mode uh, that you're after. So that's number one. Number two, uh, the, the displacement values. So, I mean, you can see that we can get into some picometer range as well. In this case, you know, the highest amplitude is about 25 picometers. In the next slide, we have a couple more examples, but at higher frequencies. Now we go to about a megahertz and a little, low, little less than a megahertz, a little above a megahertz, but you can see the data looks nice and clean as if we are making measurements without any surface in between. But yeah, in, in reality, these measurements were done through uh, silicon cap. So uh, the same types of measurements can also be done in terms of in-plane. OOP stands for out of plane. So this is in the direction of the laser beam. The same technology is also capable of measuring in in plane direction. Moving on uh, to even higher frequencies, uh, let's keep going. Uh, this is also a relatively new development, so wanted to put it out there. So, you know, when it comes to vibrometers, the current technology can handle all the way from DC to six gigahertz. Uh, so we recently did a joint study with uh, Professor Sunil Bawe at uh, Purdue University. And in this case, uh, these were some measurements on very high frequency devices, they're optical isolators um, that uh, we tested using uh, our, one of the flavors of our MSA 600s, uh, which is specifically designed to go 
to much, much higher frequencies. And here's just an example to show you, um, you know, what the data looks like. These are definitely, um, you know, one of the first times that we are actually showing these data sets because a lot of these measurements we do are, are uh, proprietary, but uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Pave at uh, Purdue, we have the, uh, you know, opportunity to show these to you. Uh, if you have any questions about these super high frequency measurements, definitely reach out. It's a, uh, it's an up and coming area with a lot of interest in the in the industry. Now, <clears throat> okay, so we stop there when it comes to these applications. Uh, hope you got a, a a decent flavor of what to expect in terms of um, you know low frequency, high frequency, small devices, big devices, um, you know, through caps, one point, several points, you know, all and everything in between. Now let's look at a, you know, uh, just laser Doppler vibrometry. Uh, okay, so why non-contact, right? So let's just begin there, right? And hopefully the example sort of answered some of those questions. Hot surface or even super cold surface, so where the temperature is such that you just cannot place a contact transducer or the structure is super light or very fragile, um, you know, uh, could be lightweight structures, even all these inflatable structures in the aerospace, you know, the space industry these days, fragile, all these MEMS microphones to mirrors, DLPs, all that, so very fragile surfaces, or even uh, we do a lot of measurements in the bio side of things on skins and inner ear, middle ear uh, type measurements as well or super high frequencies. These are other types of measurements which are very hard for by traditional sensors. So the overall you know, message is, you know, when you use a vibrometer, you are not affecting the structure in any way, basically avoiding mass loading uh, for very, very small structures, uh, as we saw in some of these MEMS app applications. Or if we are measuring through glass, for example, in a vacuum chamber, in a cryo chamber, um, you know, temperature control chambers, or through water, in water, these are, you know, some classic cases where vibrometers really shine. I guess um, very high frequencies, very low frequencies. Uh, there are no other solutions out there. Or, you know, we are getting more and more into production side of things too, where you want to avoid any kind of contraptions or actuator arms, anything coming into the view to uh, that can impede or can become a safety hazard. So high reliability in production testing type environments. Accessibility. These are, you know, some of those examples where you can see why a vibrometer would be a good alternative to consider. Uh, where either other techniques are hard to use or impossible to use. So that's where we come into picture. All right, so what can vibrometers measure on? So here we want to talk about, um, you know, different types of surfaces, but at the end of the day, anything that moves, we measure. Movement is all we need. <laughs> There's not uh, any lack of movement around when it comes to our, our world here. And the second requirement is accessibility. As long as we can see it, we can measure it. So if these two conditions are met, basically something's moving and we can see it, we measure it. I mean, we do have some cases where even when we cannot see it, we measure it uh, through this, you know, uh, encapsulated devices or people also use mirrors in some cases. Um, you know, since we've been doing it this long, our goal has always been to make it as user-friendly as possible. So right now, if you have seen any of our current generation of vibrometers, it, they are pretty much point and shoot. You put them on a tripod, you point, and then you measure. Uh, so it's fairly as you know straightforward, and then you get something, I don't know, uh, whatever you get here, basically, but some kind of time domain response that you can do something with. You can either look at it in transient or FFT, or you can do a bunch of things with the data. Um, and okay, so now how does a vibrometer work? So now we get to um, a couple of slides on uh, laser Doppler vibrometry. You know, one of these days, Chad GPT is going to do the entire presentation for us. For now, I just asked it to uh, kind of give me the definition of Doppler effect. 
since that's the fundamental principle that Polytech has been living up on uh, since last 50 years. Um, and came up with a, yeah, I think it came up with a nice definition. There was a much longer version of this, but I kind of snipped kind of a little piece of it here. Relative motion between source and the observer, you know, describes a change in frequency that is perceived by the observer that is moving relative to the wave source. So there's some relative motion between the source and the observer, and this relative motion can be perceived as a change in frequency. So the Doppler effect is basically this relationship between this change in frequency and the motion of the object. So if we can measure this Doppler shift or the change in frequency, we can back calculate or relate it to the actual vibrational velocity. That's the fundamental concept. And yeah, we have to uh, you know, acknowledge uh, Christian Doppler. I think it was 1842, if I remember correctly, when he um, yeah, proposed the, the whole theory. He probably didn't think that someone is gonna use chat GPT to explain it someday. Anyway, here we go. So here's a, a very sort of a simplified schematic of what uh, this looks like in terms of vibrometers or light. Uh, we got our laser source here. Um, we split it into two. Uh, one is the measurement beam that goes to the photo detector directly. Uh, sorry, the reference beam that goes to the photo detector. The measurement beam goes to the vibrating object. Because of this movement of the vibrating object, it causes a change in the optical path length, which causes a change in the frequency. If we can measure this Doppler shift or frequency, let's call it delta F here, it can be related to V, which is the vibrational velocity. Lambda is constant, which is the wavelength of the laser source used, which we'll get into hopefully uh, if we get time. Um, uh, we have a couple of different options there nowadays. And, but yeah, so very simply put, we are after this vibrational velocity relationship as it relates to the Doppler shift. So that's how laser Doppler vibrometry works. Before we get into a little more detail, I find this experiment super interesting. So just wanted to share it with you in 1845. So about three years after this Doppler shift was introduced by Christian Doppler, this particular Dutch meteorologist did a very interesting uh, sort of experiment to demonstrate uh, Doppler shift. He put a bunch of musicians on a train playing a single note. So the note did not change and he stood on the side, and as the train passed him, he could perceive the shift. You know, the, it seemed like the note is changing, even though they were the musicians were playing the same note. So this is how we, man, I'm just thinking what um, logistical nightmare it must have been to set up. The, now we can do the same experiment on by a little app on my phone. It's uh, it's crazy how the times have changed, but. Very interesting application to, to kind of demonstrate, not just uh, equation, but demonstrate what Doppler shift is uh, by this, uh, you know, magnanimous sort of, you know, uh, test here. Um, what do we get output wise, right? So, I mean, uh, we have always kept the output uh, very generic uh, on one hand, and then the times have changed. So you could just take uh, in uh, analog velocity displacement acceleration and take it to your data acquisition system. Very simple, oscilloscope, FFT analyzer, you know, lab view, whatever you are using. So that's still okay. Uh, with the new generation of vibrometers, you can also tap into the, the data, just the digital data source itself uh, using an ethernet cable. So you have both options open these days, uh, but yeah, basically you're gonna get this instantaneous velocity displacement acceleration, and then you do whatever you want with it. Now, <clears throat> this is a question we get quite often, what kind of surfaces uh, can a vibrometer handle? So it is pretty much, you know, starting with the most specular surface, a mirror surface, to rough surfaces, curved surfaces, black surfaces, skin measurements, right? Which are, you know, sort of traditionally very difficult, tiny, almost translucent, even transparent surfaces if you focus the beam at the right location. And uh, very tiny, you know, little, because the spot size we are talking in microns, the smallest spot size could be 
about 0.8 to 0.9 microns. So you, you can really pinpoint tiny little components if you need to. Uh, so size and then the surface texture could be all the way from specular to, we recently presented some data on these composite materials, which is just like pitch black, you know, so, so and everything in between. And, you know, um, as I mentioned, skin measurements as well. So these are, this kind of gives you a little idea of what kind of surfaces do we measure on. Now, let's, again, we don't want to spend too much time, but at least wanted to give you a feel of what these vibrometers look like. What are the different types of vibrometers out there? So by types, we mean uh, what degree of freedom or what direction is a particular vibra vibrometer measuring in? So what we call out of plane is basically the component in the direction of the laser beam. So these are uniaxial vibrometers that measure in one dimension. Then there are in-plane vibrometers, so almost like perpendicular to the laser beam. Uh, you can think about it that way. There are differential vibrometers, so there are two beams, but then you're kind of measuring the difference between the two. So you're getting like an A minus B type data. There are specific vibrometers to measure in the rotational plane. So you're measuring angular velocity, angular displacement instead of linear. So those are also have applications in the, the you know, the shaft measurements and you know, torsional measurements, uh, those kinds of application. Then we get into the full field side of things. Uh, full field could be again, uh, just like an out of plane version of it. So just one, uh, one dimension, but multiple points. Then there could be full field 3D. And then the mul so the difference between a 3D a, a, a scanning the first two and the third is the first two are what we call sequential scanning algorithms. So you're measuring one point at a time, meaning you are assuming that you can repeat the excitation. So it's a it's a steady state type uh, event that you are trying to capture. But what if you are measuring something that is not steady state? It's a transient event, and you need multiple points. In that case, what we would use is a multi-point system. And then, of course, a uh, similar concept, but at a microscopic level, which is microscope-based systems. So hopefully this is clear, because this is sometimes, um, yeah, uh, you know, so this traditional scanning, these have been around 30 years now. Multipoint is something we introduced about, about maybe 10 years ago, uh, where we saw this need that, you know, not all applications are nice and linear and steady state, you know, so we came up with the multipoint concept. Um, here are some pictures of what some of these vibrometers look like. So let's start with the single point vibrometers. Here's a very broad um, sort of cut on the different types of vibrometers, starting with a, a portable sort of all-in-one, you know, sort of even battery operated version. And then the QTEC or the Vibroflex based sensors, including the QTEC, which is the, the latest um, sort of incarnation of vibrometry, the next generation with uh, no dropouts. And then a bunch of sensors, uh, different sensors for different applications. Uh, we have these sensors for super long range applications, uh, towers, bridges, wind turbine blades. So, you know, a couple of hundred feet or more uh, type measurements. Um, those kinds of applications. Then we have some for industrial. Uh, this particular one has a built-in camera as well. So if you want to look at something tiny and then specific high-speed applications for wild train analysis and you know, multi-point measurements. So these are all, again, still fall under what we call our single point umbrella. But you know, the, the main goal of showing this slide is to kind of give you a feel for what these look like if you have never come across these uh, before. Now let's do the same for full field. Uh, full field, again, still we are talking about the sequential scanning, steady state measurements, those kinds of measurements. So, you know, here's what a 1D scanning vibrometer looks like. Um, let's add a couple more scan heads now these, you know, so this is what a 3D uh, scanning vibrometer looks like these days. And both come with, uh, you know, you can either and get a sort of a you know a computer or laptop from us or you can bring your own or whatever's more convenient for you and then if we take this 3d scanning vibrometer and actually automate it even further by mounting it on a con software controlled robots now 
we can be scanning you know with a click of a button you can be scanning large structures or it doesn't even have to be large but complex shaped structures uh, by just teaching the robot where to go and then it takes over the measurement so again this is full field sequential scanning type systems same goes for this multipoint so here's just one um, concept here one um, sort of picture to show you what a multipoint could look like in this case now we are using eight of these sensors but it could be anywhere from two to uh, 200 and anything in between so you can decide how many sensors you need for a particular application and here i've kind of shown some examples of transient movements or you know so it's a symbol or a golf club you know where you just wanted to kind of tap once and kind of measured multiple points you know or, or you know clacking on a keyboard this particular um, with the painting here is very interesting uh, here it wasn't really about a transient event but this was a painting the courtesy georgia o'keefe museum we did some work with them and here the reason we wanted to use multipoint is because we did not want to excite multiple times just to protect the painting uh, so that's why we use the multipoint uh, system in this case but you get the idea where for whatever reason you you just have one shot and you need to measure those other cases where you would use a multipoint and finally um, the um, the microscope based systems again uh, the fundamental concept still remains the same uh, we are using laser doppler vibrometry for out of plane measurements for the in-plane measurements, we use a different technology called stroboscopic video microscopy. And these systems, uh, in many cases, the customers are also interested in topography. So we have a white light interferometer also built in. Uh, this particular system can handle, uh, as you saw in some of the data, up to six gigahertz. And then we have a 3D version of it as well that can handle up to 25 megahertz. So without getting into extraordinary detail about any of these systems hopefully you get an idea and now i'm going to end with this last slide in case you guys missed it uh, heinrich rudolf hertz the person uh, that uh, we have dedicated the unit of frequency to uh, he recently had a birthday so in case you missed it and for future use you can remember february 22nd so belated happy birthday to to Heinrich Rudolf Hertz. And with that, uh, thank you very much for your time. And we can, uh, I'll hand it over back to Isabella. Perfect, thank you Vikran for your presentation. And we will now start the Q&A session. And again, you may enter questions in the Q&A box as well as the chat box at any time during the Q&A session now. Let's see what we have here. Okay, I have a first question. I'm not sure what slide you were on for this question, but I will read it and hopefully you can um, get. Uh, I assume you could derive displacement, velocity, and acceleration from measurements. Can you get measurements in orthogonal axes, X, Y, and Z? Mm -hmm. So yeah, we can, it's just that it would require a 3D version. So yeah, you could have a 3D single point or a 3D scanning system so in that case instead of using one beam we would use three beams and all the three beams would hit the surface at the same time and then we can get both out of plane and in plane vibrations in one shot um and yeah stay tuned uh, those are we have some specific applications for for example strain testing uh, and uh, high cycle fatigue testing so we have another webinar coming up in a few months uh, where we're going to focus uh, on applications only, and we're going to focus on exotic, interesting applications. So there we'll cover some of these, uh, you know, 3D measurements as well, where you can measure uh, in the orthogonal axis. So absolutely, we can. Perfect. Thank you, Ikran. Uh, next question I have, when would I use QTEC and when HINI vibrometer? Okay, yes, yeah. so we didn't uh, get into too much detail, but fundamentally, uh, there are two types of laser sources. We have the, the helium neon, which has been around, and we have been doing helium neon for the longest time, and those will still be around because 
it has its applications in terms of uh, underwater measurements, you know, where the QTEC, which is based on infrared uh, vibrometer, but uh, a, a patented technology, um, there, you know, the IR doesn't go through water. So though Heaney would be a good case for that. Or if you have perfect conditions, you know, where you're getting enough light back, then Heaney is still a better choice. Where the QTEC opens up doors is where the, the surfaces are very challenging or you just don't know what kind of surface you're getting into. So a QTEC will always handle all kinds of surfaces much better than a Heaney. So if you are not sure what kind of reflectivity you're going to get from a surface, or if you're not sure, um, you know, like, you know, if you, if you need something more robust, where you always get good rock steady signal return with no dropouts, then you go with QTEC. If your surface is very well controlled, you're close, you're getting good signal return, then he needs okay. Okay, thank you, Vikram. Next question here. What would be the advantage of using LDV over acoustical analysis for something like musical instrument? Mm. Well, <clears throat> there are a few things. So first of all, when uh, someone is using a vibrometer or a vibration-based measurement technique, they are after um, they are after the structural bond, structure born noise, you know, right? So the first step is just understanding the vibrations. Um, so that's one reason why one would consider a vibration based approach because um, you know, take a flute or a clarinet or something, for example, there's a lot of a vibration based aspect to it violin we have done a bunch of measurements on violins so first step is at least understanding structurally fundamentally how is the wave propagating how is it what is it doing and then of course there is also relationship between surface normal velocities and sound pressure levels so you can almost get a feel for your acoustics based on looking at the vibrometers now when it comes to small components sometimes it's still easier to identify noise sources based on vibrations as opposed to acoustics. Uh, I mean, there could be all kinds of reflections. Sometimes it's very hard to identify or pinpoint a noise source using a microphone, for example, as compared to a vibrometer, which is just a little, you know, few microns dots. You, to be able to isolate the noise source, you have a much higher chance of doing it based on a, a vibration-based technique. Okay, next question here. Um, is there any software you provide for acquisition? We have trouble connecting to our VR controller and we're looking for a simple acquisition system to see what kind of displacement we see when using a single point vibrometer. Yes, uh, yeah, please reach out offline. Yeah, we have, um, we have several choices, you know, something as simple as a two channel, you know, data acquisition system to um, you know, this ethernet-based system. So it depends on what kind of sensor you have. So a little information on your particular vibrometer will help, but yeah, no, definitely we have a few choices. We can discuss, see if it's a good fit for you. Okay, our next question. What is the range of measurements for PSV 500 system? Can it measure large deformations? Got it. Okay, also just a side note about the previous uh, question. Yeah, I mean, we do work closely with VR. So, um, you know, we'll be happy to work with them to address any issues you may have as well. Uh, They're good friends and uh, partners. So, uh, okay, uh, PSV, what kind of measurements, how large of a measurement? So it all depends on your structure and how far you are. So the farther away you go, the larger the depth of field. So the larger you, larger vibrations you can measure. So as long as you are on the surface, right? So you, if the amplitudes are so large that you just fall off the surface, now you're not measuring at all, of course, right? But as long as you are on the surface, it's still gonna do a spatial average wherever the beam is moving. So if you have large amplitudes, the suggestion would be to go kind of a little farther out because that'll give you a larger depth of field, meaning that's you know the, the amount of area where your beam is still gonna stay focused. So, you know, I hope this helps somewhat. If not, please, let's talk about it offline. Please reach out. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, uh, let me be a little more specific. Maybe, uh, yeah, so yeah, it could be, you know, we have customers measuring 
you know, some of these wind turbine uh, blade measurements, they are like moving several inches, you know, and we still measure just fine. Uh, technically, there is no limitation. I mean, you, you could be measuring meters. The challenge is that you just stop, you, you don't get enough light back or you may be falling off the surface, so. Thank you, Vikrant. Uh, our next question is, what's the reason to use reference laser or signal to do complex averaging instead of magnitude averaging? Yeah, so um, I, this particular question must be coming from someone who has used a vibrometer. So number one, uh, first of all, I would uh, recommend that uh, please uh, read through, uh, we have a nice theory manual. Uh, that is uh, part of the deliverables. It has a very nice explanation of averaging and which one is preferred when. So there we do compare no averaging to complex averaging to magnitude averaging. So the reason we do complex averaging is if you look at the, basically the noise source, it's random. So uh, a complex, when you take an average in complex domain, where you take care of the phase information as well, take into account phase information as well, your overall, you will reduce your noise floor even further with averaging as compared to magnitude averaging. So if with random noise sources, complex averaging is, is always preferred. And as this particular person noticed, when we do complex averaging, now we have information on the phase as well. So if you have done magnitude averaging, you can only look at the magnitude data. But because of complex averaging, now we are saving the magnitude and phase are real and imaginary. So we can display the data in both, you know, either magnitude or magnitude and phase. And reference data is very critical because especially with scanning vibrometers, we need some kind of reference. Um, I'm talking about the sequential scanning. We need some reference so that we have some phase information. There has to be some commonality between all the points that I'm measuring. And that common phase reference is coming from this reference measurement. It could be a, a single point vibrometer, it could be a source signal, it could be an accelerometer, it could be a microphone, it could be anything that's stationary that's at one point. Thank you, Vikrant. Uh, our next question here is, I've seen examples where LDV is used to measure surface roughness at different scales. Can you help mm. explain how velocity displacement is converted to topography? Very interesting question. Um, yeah, so first of all, we have surface roughness measurement tools altogether, and we have dedicated webinars addressing surface roughness, flatness of so form and finish type applications, but those are based on white light interferometry. So that's a well-established technique for static surfaces. Uh, however, uh, for some specific cases, we have done surface roughness measurements using vibrometers. And this is done um, for highly specular surfaces. So the surface has to be like almost mirror-like where any change in the distance, basically, if there's a little peak or a little valley, which is like a roughness value, it'll result in a change in displacement in the data. So anytime you see a displacement, positive or negative, you can relate it back to a certain pit or you know a, a peak or a valley on your surface. So imagine if you have a, a wafer that you're trying to map out and then if you scan the whole surface, you'll get some displacement value for each uh, point that you define and then you can sort of recreate a roughness value. So yeah, that, that's been uh, studied in detail. Um, but um, yeah, definitely a lot more uh, specialized application. Thank you, Vikran. Um, I have now a few questions from the same attendee on the same topic, so I will read mm -hmm. them, but if you need me to repeat any, please let me know. Mm -hmm. um, is RLV 5500 vibrometer for measurement based on laser? I'm looking to measure torsional vibration, angular displacement of running motor, how to measure and what to use, and do I have to clean the surface of running shaft or can I use the direct RLV directly on it? Okay, no, good one. Yeah, so RLV is also a laser Doppler vibrometer based system. Instead of one beam, now it has two beams. So if I have a shaft um, like my pen here, 
basically I would in ideal case scenario I would have the two beams of the RLV straddle the center line so one will go above the shaft and the other one will go below the shaft uh, below so above the center line and below the center line and uh, RLV is a special design of an interferometer because basically it has two interferometers built inside the box so those two beams hit the surface and then we use the beam spacing which is fixed and then these two components of the vibrometer to calculate angular velocity and angular displacement. This uh, RLV is, is, that's what it's designed for and measures RPM as well. It does require that you put um, uh, retroreflective tape around the circumference of the shaft uh, because this uh, particular measurement is very challenging with all the movement in plane so it does require that you, um, you know, it's not using anything on the tape to kind of, you know, it's not like a proximity sensor or anything or a tachometer, but it does require the tape so that we get ample light back. So you don't need to, you can't clean it, but um, you absolutely need the uh, retroreflective tape. And, and it comes with it. So whether you are renting it or you buy it, we always uh, ship the right type of tape with it. Uh, follow up, Vikran. It says, if it's running, then how? Oh, and then. Uh, if it's running, then how? Um, it's, uh, I'm, so, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't think I, I don't understand. Uh, yes, I mean, yeah, of course, uh, you'll have to stop it once to basically apply the tape uh, without, uh, you know, yeah. So that, that's a prerequisite. So you put the tape and then you run it. Yeah, so you can measure even just DC movement, it doesn't even have to rotate. You know, we had an application where they just wanted to measure um, angles of certain movement, uh, or it could be moving as, as much as like 20,000 RPM, and uh, you'll be able to measure the angular velocity and displacement at the same time. Um, I'll read this to follow up, and then uh, we'll be done on the oh, topic. Please, yeah. uh, can the tape be wrapped? And then, then I can use strain gauge if I want to stop. The tape can be wrapped. Yeah, absolutely. As long as it sticks, that doesn't fly off. <laughs> you know, as long as it sticks on it, you know, it's it's fair. I mean, we don't make the tape. It's just uh, some standard 3M tape. But yeah, you can absolutely, yeah, as long as it stays on it, you know, and it's called retro reflective tape. Uh, retro meaning the angle of reflection is in the same direction as the angle of incidence um, as opposed to reflective. So um, that's what we want. Definitely reach out offline. I mean, if this is uh, something of interest, maybe we can discuss some more um, about this application. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Vikran. I have one last question here, unless there's something that comes in in between. But um, last question, is there any restriction on the angle between the laser pointer and the structure? Um, no, so so remember that schematic where I showed the vibrometer, you know, the laser sources coming out, we are measuring on the surface and we are counting on light coming back. The back reflected light from the measurement object has to come back to the sensor, <clears throat> to the detector. So as long as there is light coming back, uh, we are good. Uh, and over the years, over the decades, uh, our vibrometers can do more and more with little light coming back. So I'm getting to your question. So how do we lose light? So the perfect scenario would be you're shooting at something nice and reflective and you're perfectly normal. You're getting all the light back in the world. Now, if you are at an angle, yeah, you, you basically start losing some light, some light. But again, as I said, it so much depends on your surface. Uh, I mean, we have done measurements at like, grazing incidents on 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 um, road surfaces these days you know it's at a very steep angles and we still get enough light back to to make a measurement so but again it just always depends on the surface we, as long as we can get some light back so if i'm measuring at a very steep angle but let's say i'm measuring on a mirror it's not going to work right because there's nothing coming back at that point if it's a mirror surface but as long as there is some surface some roughness to the surface uh, the, the the vibrometers these days are are, are quite uh, forgiving to uh, you know misalignments or angles uh, these days. So yeah, you would use light, lose light with angles. You'd lose light with very long distances. So all these are some factors you would uh, take into consideration before selecting a Heaney or a QTEC. 
Perfect. Thank you, Vikran. Um, we have a couple questions regarding mm -hmm. if it's recorded. Um, I, I can answer that. Yes, the webinar is recorded. Uh, we will post it on our GoToStage channel as well as our YouTube channel. So we have that. And uh, all I can say is uh, thank you, Vikran, for answering the questions and for your presentation. Bring it on. Thank you. <laughs> thank you to everyone who asked these questions. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. And of course, we're looking forward to welcoming you again to any of our upcoming webinars or events. Have a great day.